And interestingly enough, we're right in the middle of that final night that the Lord had with his disciples in John chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up your Bibles to John chapter 15. As we look today at Jesus, our source of life. I want to read the first eight verses, then we'll pray and we're going to jump into this thing and begin to dissect it. John chapter 15 verse 1 says this, Jesus speaking to his disciples, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what a powerful passage of scripture this is. Lord, you being our source of life, you the vine, we the branches. And it is from that vine that we get our life juices, that spiritual flow that goes into us, Lord, your branches and produces fruit in our life, in our family's life and to the world around us, that they may partake of it and that they may taste of your goodness and be drawn into you because of it. So Lord, let the sweetness of the fruit that you produce in us, Lord, just show today in our lives and show today through the teaching of your word that you would minister to us, you would challenge us, God. You would, Lord, help us understand things that you do in our life and why you do it so that we might produce more fruit. So Lord, we give you this time. We thank you for it. We ask now you would teach us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we find ourselves here as we look at Jesus, our source of life. We find ourselves today in the middle of Jesus' final night before his crucifixion, and he has just finished the Last Supper. If you remember there in verse 31 of chapter 14, he said, Arise and let us go from here. And so that set the setting for where we left last time, that the Lord is about to leave there, and now they're about to travel down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so this teaching that we're looking at today that goes on between here, these next couple of chapters, is the Lord teaching them as they're making their way down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when they get to the Garden of Gethsemane at some point, and then we'll see the teaching breaks off, and the Lord breaks off to pray and that whole process. But this is where we are. And there's no doubt as the Lord is walking, he's probably walking and teaching this, what we're going to be reading today, using the vineyards around them, using the visual symbols, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. Um, but again, this is the place where Jesus will end up in the garden, where he'll be arrested. And now we see as he begins to head that way, he's going to use these analogies of the vine and the vineyard. And according to historians, there were many vineyards around there. Again, as I said, no doubt Jesus walking through a vineyard under the moonlight. As he's traveling down to the Garden of Gethsemane, pictured in your mind, this was the non-rainy season, so it wouldn't have been cloudy. Maybe a spot cloud here and there, but it would have been clear and beautiful. The moon would have been absolutely full because this is the week of the Passover, and the moon's always full at the week of the Passover, the way the Jewish calendar works. And so the bottom line is they would have seen everything by moonlight. Very bright, very clear, the vineyards, the temple, everything around them as they're working their way down as Jesus was teaching them and using very literal, visible pictures to teach them some very important spiritual truths, which we will learn as well today. But the most important truth he's going to teach them that we need to learn today is this. He is our source of life. We're going to see again that scripture where Jesus said, you know what, you can do nothing apart from me. It took me a lot of years to really believe that and understand it. It's not that I didn't believe the word of the Lord, but I thought, well, certainly I can do something. I mean, I'll show up and I'll have lots of energy and I'll read the Bible and we'll do this or whatever and things will happen. Here's what I've learned. It doesn't matter how much energy or what you can do or things that you produce or put on. If it's not done by the spirit of the Lord, there is no lasting fruit. It may look like there's been something great that happened, but only lasting fruit will come through God working through the vine Jesus into the branches and working in our life and through ministry as he leads it, not as we lead it, as he leads it. 
So even as the vine was the source of life for the branch, Jesus is our source of life. And everything needs a source of life, everything. As you know, they've been looking for life on Mars here recently. Can they find any life on Mars? And even wanted to move to Mars and put life there if there's not any there. And uh, recently I was reading about a biology class where the teacher asked the students, they said, all right, here's your assignment. You've got to write down the answer and turn this in. If you could take anything from this lab, anything we have here, or whatever we have that, that you could take with you and go to Mars to do any kind of test that you could do, how would you determine that there was actually life on Mars? And when he received the papers back, he found that one student, always kind of a little smarty pants in every class, right? He picks up the paper and one of the students wrote on there, you know, how do I prove that there's determined that there's life on Mars? He said, first of all, ask the inhabitants. He said, even, yeah, even a negative answer would be significant. The teacher gave him an A <laughs> because he was clever. But again, it's not only trying to find life, it's oftentimes trying to get the most out of life. Trying to do what we can, even as believers, we want the most out of life. And the world tries to find the most out of life as well. It was Irma Bombeck who said, pertaining to the sinking of the Titanic, she said, seize the moment. Remember all those women on the Titanic who waved off the dessert cart. Now again, I know that's not really good to make a joke about the Titanic, but she's making a point. Life comes around one time, don't waste it. Make sure you grab all the gusto that you can in life and use it for God's glory. That would be for the believer in that sense. And now Jesus is gonna tell them and us, you want life? But if we asked ourselves this morning, who in here wants life? I think we'd all raise our hand, we want life. You want life? It's Jesus. And for those of you that have tried to find life in other places, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It works for a little while. As a matter of fact, it's kind of thrilling for a little while. The Bible says fun is, uh, it's fun. <laughs> Not fun is sin for a season. No, sin is fun for a season. The Bible says that. God doesn't pretend that sin's not fun. You see, God created all the pleasures. But these are just shadows of the true pleasures in heaven. The Bible says that at God's right hand, note this, for those of you that are trying to fill your life up with earthly pleasures, listen what it says. At the right hand of the Father are pleasures forevermore. And he says here, everything down here, note this, is but a shadow. That means any pleasure we seek down here is nothing. There's no drug, there's no physical thing, there's nothing we can do. It is nothing compared to the glory and the pleasures that await for us in heaven. And I mean that in a pure and holy way. Who knows what God has in store for us? It's gonna be amazing. But we try to fill it up with earthly things, don't we? And the bottom line is it doesn't work. It works for a while and then we get empty again. And we say, is this all there is? This is it? This is all life has to offer? Why are we even living? Jesus is why we're living. And we're living to serve and love him. He is our source of life. Let's jump into it. Notice as he shares with them, as again, as I said, probably the setting, they're walking down through the Garden of Gethsemane, the moonlight shining bright, probably walking through a vineyard or somewhere around one. And he says this, I am the true vine. I wonder if they're looking at one. He makes a point, it's me. I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, there's a couple things to look at here. First of all, he refers to himself not only as a vine, but the true vine, or literally the genuine vine. And why? Because, again, in Scripture, Israel is referred to as the vine of God. Israel is referred to as a vineyard that's been planted, if you will. More of a, not the vine of God as much as a vineyard that's been planted. And what Jesus is saying is, it's not Israel that's your source of life. It's not the fact that you're God's people that's your source of life. It's not the temple that is your source of life. It's me. I'm your source of life. And if you want to live, you've got to be plugged into me and you've got to stay in me because my life's going to flow through to you. And it's the only way you can get it. You can't get life by bypassing the vine if you're a branch. The branch can't say, you know what, I'm going to just skip this vine. I don't know that I like the vine that much. I'm glad it worked for all you other branches. But I'm going to try to get you know, sustenance another way. You're going to die on the vine because you can only get your life source from the one that is the vine, and that is Jesus. And so he refers to himself as the true vine, the genuine vine, not Israel, not these other things. And again, this would have been something that would have made a great point to them as they thought about it and visualized these vines, if you will, seeing them quite literally um, and showing the, uh, the connection here of Jesus to the Father is also important. He says, I'm the vine, but he's the vine dresser. He's the one that's going to be working in your life. He's the one that's going to be pruning and shaping and doing all these things in your life. So we work as a team. You're in us. We're in him. And remember, he had just shared, them with that, shared that with them rather back in chapter 14. That is, we would say that the father is the gardener, if you will. 
But there's something else that makes this very interesting to me, and I don't know whether or not they really would have seen it from where they were walking or not, but I know they knew what it was, and that is this. On the temple itself, when you walked into the temple, before you got to the door of the temple, you walked to these pillars that were on either side and across the top, and they were wrapped in this golden vine, this golden grapevine that had been purchased and made in, in Greece and shipped over for the temple. Uh, the historians record this. In the second temple at the entrance was this great vine. Everyone knew about the vine. It was a beautiful ornament. It was something that even when you brought sacrifices there, they would sometimes put things on, those, uh, on the actual vine to hold them. There's a picture of an artist rendering of it. And I don't know, the little stick guys at the bottom look kind of funny. But just to, if you can just forget about them, the guy climbing up the curtain, not sure what he's doing right there. But either way, um, you know, let's pray for him. Call the authorities. Somebody get him down. Anyway, but notice the vine all the way around the top. And this is what it says according to history, the Midot, which is the Jewish rules for norms of interpretation. Here's what it says in there about this golden vine in the second temple. It says, there was a golden vine that stood over the entrance of the sanctuary, trained over the posts, and whosoever gave a leaf or a berry or a cluster, that would be your first fruit offerings from the field, uh, as a free will offering, they brought it to the priest and he hung it there on the vine. So they literally would take offerings and hang them off those vines. But everybody knew about the vine. Everybody knew the beauty of the vine. And here's what's exciting to me is you have the vine and then right behind the vine, you have the door. What did Jesus just tell them earlier? He said, I am the door. If you want to get to the Father, you've got to go through me. Now he says, I am the vine. And they would have been thinking, wow, the vine. They might have even have seen it in the moonlight. We don't know as large as it was from where they were walking. But he goes, if you want to get into the presence of the Father, you've got to go through the vine and you've got to go through the door. And I'm both of them. I'm the vine and I'm the door. And there's no other way into the temple of God. We would say there's no other way into the presence of God except through that vine and through that door. And so again, all types of analogies and beautiful pictures being made in their mind as he's telling them this and just all they're thinking about. And he says, every branch in me, note that, I have that underline, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now again, in a moment, Jesus will tell them, uh, again, he'll deal with the whole issue of uh, branches and being connected to the Lord. But again, we're gonna see in this passage today, we're gonna have some theological challenges. And in the midst of these theological challenges, I'm gonna do my best to give you all the schools of thought and share everything that I can as far as what the scripture reveals and then let God sort that out in your own hearts. But the, you know, the good thing about teaching through all of the Bible line by line and verse by verse is you teach through all the Bible line by line and verse by verse. And that way you can't skip anything. You can't pick your favorite subjects and say, well, I'm not gonna teach on that one. I'm not gonna tell, oh, they're here today. I'll skip that and teach on this. Oh, they give a lot of money. I can't talk about that. We'll teach on this. No, every line we come to, every verse we come to, we cover it. That's the good thing about it. The bad thing is, is oftentimes you come to things that are oftentimes challenging. And they're very challenging oftentimes theologically, and no doubt that will be the case for some of us today. So I will do my best as an honest expositor to lay out what the Bible teaches, what the Bible says, the different schools of thought concerning this issue, and then let God sort that out in your heart. But the first thing we need to note here is this. Jesus here makes it very clear that the branches he is speaking of are in him. Now, first of all, there's no way to be in Jesus unless you know him. You can't be in Jesus unless you are born again. You can't be in Jesus unless you are saved. There is no unbeliever that is in Jesus. It's only through repentance and being born again that we can be in him. And the, Christ, the Bible talks all through the scriptures about this, that we're in Christ and Christ is in us. We're one with him. We're disconnected from Christ until we're born again and then we're in him. So we know from the context here, he's speaking of believers, that is those born again because there's no other way to be in Jesus. Secondly, we need to note this, that Jesus would never expect any spiritual fruit from an unbeliever. You're not gonna look at someone that's not a vine and say, now give me fruit. You're not part of the vine. Give me fruit. Well, that's, that's an absurd request because you can't give fruit unless you're in the vine and able to get that source and produce that fruit. So the first thing we have to note here is Jesus is speaking of the born again believer. And notice he says, any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now here's where the challenge begins. And there's going to be more than one challenge today. What does it mean any Christian that is um, does not bear fruit, he takes away? What does that mean? Well, we're going to examine that a little bit more in a moment. But before we get to that, I want to point out the fact here that he says about what those of us that are connected in the vine are supposed to do. 
Notice he says here that we will bear fruit and that we'll be pruned so that we can bear more fruit. That is, the Father's the vine dresser. They're the ones that would prune the fruit. Notice he says he takes the branch away. It's a pruning process. And the pruning process is that every Christian that bears spiritual fruit, the Father will prune or clip away areas that are not productive. Here's why, that more fruit may be born. That is, uh, part of productivity is the flow that comes to us so that we can thrive. And anything that hinders the flow of God's Spirit coming through us is going to hinder our fruit bearing and our thriving. Now look, I'm not a gardener, so I'm not going to pretend to be. But I do and I have looked up what it is to garden. And I do know a little bit about the way that some people deal with tomatoes. And that is a lot of times with tomatoes, they have toward the bottom of them what they call suckers. And they say they, they suck all the life out of the vine. And if you don't take them out of the part of the plant or whatever, then a part of the juices that would be going up to make these beautiful red tomatoes or yellow or whatever color they are is going to go to these little things that are pulling away the, the juices and make it not as productive. So what do you do? You break those things off and you get rid of them. And what it does is it allows more flow to go to the places that are healthy and can produce a better crop. That is you. That is you. That's exactly what the Lord is. What he's saying is this, look, there are things in your life, and some of you right now are probably going to be convicted as I share this. There are things in your life that are hindering you from producing the fruit that God wants you to produce because it's sucking life out of you before it can get to the place it needs to be. And there's a lot of different things that can be. It doesn't have to always be something bad. There may be some freedom that you have in Christ. I'm free in Christ. I can do this. The Bible says I can. Yeah, you're right. You can. But is it helping your fruit increase or is it holding you back? You see, sometimes it's better to give our freedoms up so that we can grow more in Jesus than it is to make some big stand about the freedoms we have in Christ. Listen, never let anyone take your freedoms. I would never take your freedom in Christ. We are not under the law. We are free in Jesus Christ. And anybody that tries to put you under bondage is not a true faithful minister of the gospel. But at the same time, there are times when wisdom would say some of those freedoms you need to lay aside. There are things in my life as a pastor that I'm free to do but I don't do it for your sake. Because some of you, your backgrounds that you came out of, if you saw me doing something that I took freedom in and you come out of a background where you were stumbling in it, what's that gonna do for you? That's gonna cause you to stumble. And if I love you, I'm gonna lay it down. What did Paul say? Paul said this, they were, they were buying meats from the false temples. There was nothing wrong in eating meat, but the meats had been offered to idols. They'd been offered to false gods. And so people were, they were stumbled by that. Where did you get that steak? Well, I got it down there, you know, the temple of Aphrodite. <gasps> the temple of Aphrodite, that's a demon steak. Well, oh my goodness, I didn't realize I might be offended by my steak and whatever. Paul said, look, if you can eat your steak and nobody knows it and you enjoy your steak and you're free in Christ, that's fine. You got that freedom. But don't eat your steak to the expense of a brother that's going to stumble. And Paul went on and said this. He said, if my Big Mac causes someone to stumble. Now that's in the Greek. <laughs> if I go to McDavid's <laughs> and it causes somebody to stumble, I'll never eat at McDavid's again. I'll never have another Big Mac. Guys, that's love. That's love. To be able to lay something down for the sake of others. And here's what happens. Not only do you help others grow, you're going to grow because now those little suckers that are pulling all the life out of you, stuff in your life that doesn't need to be there, now you can grow and produce more because it, it goes farther up the vine and you can produce more fruit. And it could be that God is convicting you right now of a lot of the energies that are going into your life or pulling away from things that God could do. And it could be, who knows what it could be. You could go all kinds of things. It might be old relationships. Maybe there's a relationship you need to break off. You know that they're not a believer, but maybe they'll get saved. God is saying, you know you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to be unequally yoked. You're draining the vine. You need to cut that off. But that hurts. You know what? Sometimes pruning is painful. But when God is the master gardener, he will only prune what will cause us to flourish all the more. And there'll be a much greater reward for you being obedient and letting God work in that area. It may be certain magazines. It may be certain movies. Yes, you're free in Christ. But there may be something where God is saying, you don't need to be involved in that. It's holding you back in your walk with God. What does it say in another place? Paul said, lay aside the weights that so easily hold you back. God wants us to be fruit producing Christians. And we'll see in a moment, there's a progression to that fruit producing. And so again, these, um, th there's uh, also slow, what's called low hanging branches that get in the way as well. 
The vines will oftentimes have these low-hanging branches, and these low-hanging branches are so low, they sit there and they just lay on the ground. They lay in the dirt. They lay in the earth. They lay on the world. You get the analogy. That is, if we have low-hanging branches in our life, that we're just going to kind of keep a part of the world going, you know, just some low-hanging branches down here. We get a little bit dirty from time to time, but it's not really that bad, and I know the Lord, and I know I'm going to heaven or whatever. Listen, the problem is, is what happens to those low-hanging branches is they get diseased, and the disease would oftentimes move into the vine and then destroy the rest of the vine. If you allow this low-hanging branch to just play in the world and continue to let it go, you're going to get diseased from the world. And that disease is going to hurt your entire plant. It's going to hurt your entire productivity for the Lord. How much better to cut those lower branches off and say, you know what? Forget that. I'm branching out. I'm moving on in Jesus. I'm going to go to higher things, and I want God to flow through me. That's often what the Lord is waiting in many believers' lives. He's waiting on you to let him move more. But you're not allowing him to because you're holding on to these things that can be diseased and pull you back into the disease of the world. Notice what he says to them. He speaks to them. And again, kind of this picture of washing off the fruit so that it's usable and edible. Look at verse 3. He says, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. I've been teaching you for three years. I've poured in my water. The Bible says that we're cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. That is, God washes all the junk out of our mind from our past as we spend time in the word and time in prayer. God cleanses us. And what Jesus is saying is, you guys have been cleansed. You've been washed off. But, but that, and that's necessary in order for you to be usable for people around you, for the Father to use you as good fruit. You've got to be washed off. You know, I don't know about you guys, but maybe I'm probably the extreme on that. I, you go and buy fruit at the market. I, I don't care if it says pre-washed or not. Even these salads, that's pre-washed. Yeah, by who? I mean, I don't know what's, you know, but, you know, what does that mean? I think you rinse it off again, right? And I think that that's a wise thing to do is be in that habit of cleaning the fruit. But then once the fruit is cleansed, it's ready to be used. He's going to make the point, yeah, you're already clean, but you need to produce even more fruit. And now you've got to be pruned, and you've got to be grown, and you've got to, be, you've got to move to a whole new area here. And so the cleansing has taken place, but now the preparation for greater fruit has to happen as well. And Jesus giving them these final words, wanting them to grow before he leaves and to know how to grow. And look what he says in verse 4. He says, abide in me, again, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, the word abide is the word here in the language meno, and it means to remain in or stay in. To remain in or stay in. So what the Lord is saying is you're clean, you're already in me, now stay in me. Stay connected. Stay in a place where where fruit can flow from your life, where the juices from my vine can go into you, the branch, and you can be used. You see, in vines and in believers, both are non-productive if they're not constantly connected to the source of life. And Jesus, for us, is that source of life. So Jesus is saying we must abide in him. We must literally stay in him if we're going to bear any fruit. And yet how many Christians simply wander off after a while and they wonder why they're never used by the Lord? This kind of leave. Where's the fruit in my life? You know, I challenge you this morning. What, what fruit are you producing? Are you producing Christian fruit? If people are around you because they look at your tree and go, wow, that's, that's, that's Christian fruit. I can tell what kind of tree that is. Or would people around you go, you know what? I'm not quite sure what kind of tree that is. I'm kind of waiting to see what comes down. I, I've, I think I've seen these leaves before. I'm not sure. Are we producing fruit? And we can do a self-evaluation. If we are producing fruit, what kind of fruit is it? Is it fruit that's helping those around us and making others healthy and strong and drawing people to the true vine? Or is it fruit of the world? Is all we're thinking about is things of the world? Is, is what's in our life the things of the world? Then, then we have to ask ourselves, are we truly a Christian tree, number one? That's a good challenge. And the second thing is, yes, I know I know Jesus. Then why am I not producing fruit? I can tell you why right now. You're not abiding in the vine. You're not in the word. You're not in prayer. Unless you're in the word and in prayer, you can't get life-giving source to give life out and produce fruit. It's that simple. It's not hard. But so many believers miss it because they don't stay connected to the vine. But what about those that we know that we've seen walk with the Lord for years and suddenly they're disconnected, it seems, from the vine, disconnected from the Lord. And I'm not talking about a temporary backside. I'm talking about somebody who walks away. And you see them walk away. I've seen people, I've known of one particular man that for years and years and years walked with God and was used in a great way for evangelism and everything and suddenly just walked away. 
And he said, you know what, I'm an atheist now. I don't believe in God at all. And yet he was used for many years leading thousands of people to Christ. He just walked away. What about that person? What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say anything? And this is where it gets a little theologically challenging. And that is this, and I want to ask you this question. Is it possible as a believer to completely disconnect from the Lord? And let me challenge you with this. If it's not possible, why did the Lord say, stay in me? You see, if my only option was to stay in him, why would the Lord bid me to do that? There has to be a reason the Lord said, stay in me. What does he mean? Now, there are three schools of thought. As I said, I'm going to do my best to be an honest expositor. I'm going to do my best to be a pastor that thinks this through with you and allows you to work through this yourself. There are three schools of thought concerning these verses. The first school of thought says this, these branches that are in Jesus are not really Christians at all. So they are cut off and they're thrown into the fire. And the analogy they say is pretty evident what happens to them. So they're not, they never were really Christians. The problem with that particular approach is he said every branch in me. So Jesus identified them as branches that were already in him. Well, the second school of thought says this, and that is referring to Christians who fall away, that it may simply be God taking certain Christians home early because of their disobedience. It might be that. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, you can look it up later, says this, there is a sin that leads unto death. And in context, what John is saying is, there are some sins that believers do where God takes them home early. God says, you know what, you know, as a parent, think about this as a parent, we do the same thing. You're there at the pool and the brother keeps dunking the little sister and dun stop it. I'm taking it. If you keep dunking your little sister, you're done for the day. I'm going to dunk my, out of the pool, you're done for the day. I don't it fair. I, I'm sorry. You're done. All you're doing is hurting your brother and your sister. Get out of the pool. And 1 John 5 talks about that. It could be that God is referring here to those that get cut off early and they're taken on to the kingdom of God. I don't know. But the last school of thought says this. Scripture says clearly there's no power on heaven or on earth that can take us away or remove us from the love of God. And Jesus said this, no one can snatch you out of my hand. There's no power that can take you out of the Lord's hand. So it's pretty clear here that no one can pull you from God's hand, that no one can separate you by some kind of attack or whatever from the love of God. And the Bible does say that. However, the Bible says nowhere that you can't choose to walk out. And there's a big difference. Let me say this. I want to say this emphatically. I do not believe it is possible to lose your salvation. I do not believe that. But I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says you can't leave it. And a very big difference in the two. And this passage here is one of those theologically challenging passages. There are multiple like this throughout the Bible. We don't have time to do an exhaustive study in it. But the bottom line is, uh, it, I believe in this situation, it causes a, a godly fear and a holy fear in the heart. You may say, well, Mark, how can we be sure? How can we know for sure? Listen, God is the one that knows for sure, but I know how to make this a non-issue. This is a non-issue as long as what? As long as you abide. If you abide, this doesn't even need to be discussed theologically. People don't need to argue about it in universities. People don't need to make their stand on which side they stand on or which side they don't. The bottom line is abide and it is a non-issue. It's interesting to me, the only person this should be an issue to is the person who's deciding to maybe live in the world a little bit and they're trying to justify that it's okay because I know I'm in the vine and there's nothing that could ever happen. So I can kind of, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't have all the answers, I'm just a man. But I'm working on a book right now called Scriptures I Can't Ignore. This is part of it. I can't ignore what the Lord said here. The Lord said if you're in the vine and you're not producing fruit, at some point you'll be taken away. In a moment we're going to see, he says, the vine will wither and be thrown into the fire. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I want to say this, I don't believe that God would hold any man a prisoner. That wouldn't be love. But I do believe that God will firmly keep and hold all that love him and desire to be kept. And I'll leave that between you and the Lord, which school of thought you stand in. I'm not going to fight with you about it. But I'll say for my sake, I'll tell you this much, it keeps a holy fear in my heart. Because it makes me go, you know what? I don't know. And here's enough question here that I can't nail it down. But I'm not taking a chance. I'm choosing to abide. And my appeal to you today is abide. Abide. Don't make it an issue. As long as we abide, it will never be an issue. And I want you to know this as well. I have 100% peace and confidence in my eternal security. I don't question it one bit. Total rest, 
total peace because I know my Lord and I know the one who holds me. And I'm certainly not going to walk out, I can tell you that. If that's possible, I'm not going to do it. But the bottom line is I can't ignore what the Lord is saying here. He says again, look at this in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides, or literally meno, stays in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Notice he says here, if we continue to abide, we will bear much fruit. Now earlier, what did he say? He's in verse 2, he said this, you'll bear fruit. And then also in verse 2, he said, you'll bear more fruit. And now he says in verse 5, you will bear what? Much fruit. There is an intentional progression here that the Lord is showing us, and that is this. The longer we walk with the Lord and abide in his word and in his prayer and in him, the more fruit we're going to produce. I don't know about you guys. Listen, I'm pretty fruity, but I'm not happy with the fruit I'm producing. Now, maybe you might say, you know what? I'm happy with the fruit I'm producing. I'm not happy with it. I look at my fruit and I've been praying this week, God, I want to produce more fruit. I feel like I'm, a, I'm producing fruit. I see it. I can stand back and go, all right, look at Mark from the outside. Okay, I see some fruit. Okay, all right, all right, okay, I got it. I want the branches to be bending over. And the more the branches bend over, the more people can take. And the younger ones can easily reach. And that should be the desire of all of us, that we produce so much fruit. I'm, I am not satisfied with the fruit I'm producing, and I pray that God will continue to produce more fruit in, in my life till the day I die. You need to have the same desire, that, and I know you do, that God will produce more and more fruit, greater and greater things for the Lord. And I'm not talking about, you know, numbers or events or that kind of thing. I'm talking about true spiritual fruit of God that changes your life and changes people's lives around you. And so I love that here because, again, there's this progression that he promises. And notice here at the end of the verse, he says, notice this, without him you can do nothing. It is in the double negative, which literally you could read it this way. It is actually a positive statement of our inability to do anything spiritual without him. He's positively saying, I'm saying positively that you can't do anything. Double negative. You can't, you can't. You can try. And again, this is where I've learned some hard lessons. And again, from ministry over the years, there are things that I've invested in financially as well as time-wise. And I thought, and on the surface, listen, on the outside, it looked like this is fruit. Wow, this had to be fruit. And I look back now over the years, and I go, you know what? I don't know that any fruit came from that. Zero. I think that was probably all Mark. And that's very depressing. But it's also very educational. Because I said, okay, God, I don't want to waste the church's money. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste the church's time. I don't want to waste anything. I want everything to be focused in on you, Lord, and let it produce fruit for God. And so that needs to be our prayer, that God would do that. It's interesting, when Zerubbabel was trying to rebuild the second temple of God, it says in Zechariah 4, 6b, God said, not by might nor by power, that is man's, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so God is the one that made the temple happen for Zerubbabel. It wasn't Zerubbabel, it was God. And so God is the one that does it. And we have to say, God, we want you to do this through us. For without him, and I have that underlined as well, we can do nothing. Look verse 6, and if anyone does not abide or stay in me, literally, it literally reads, if anyone does not stay in me, he's cast out as a branch and he's withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. Now, again, the theological struggles only increase. Again, whatever camp you stand in, fine. Stand in that camp. Just make sure you have that confidence in the camp you're standing in and make sure you're abiding. But the analogies here are pretty stark and pretty clear. And when you follow the whole analogies that God uses throughout Scripture, God uses what is called expositional constancy. That is the imagery that God uses. He uses this to mean the same thing throughout the Scripture. And I've heard well-meaning Christians say, well, this just means you're being pruned. I have never seen a pruning process where the branch itself is cut off, laid aside to wither, then burned, and then suddenly I go out and it's producing more fruit. I've never seen that. Now, maybe there's something I don't know, and I don't mean that in a sarcastic way, but I'm saying these are the kind of verses that I can't ignore, and I can't just pretend they're not there. So regardless of your theological bent or position, my job as your pastor is to lay it out there and tell you what it says, and now it's between you and God what you do with it. But I know for me, it puts a holy fear in my heart. And for me, it drives me to Jesus. And I can tell you this, I'm going to abide. That's for sure. Now, it's interesting that along the path to Gethsemane, there were vineyards, 
and there would be burn piles at the vineyards. This is very uh, uh, evident, clear in my mind. It seems like every time I do a teaching, God gives me something very visual to see it. This week we had burn piles at our house. We're down, you know, we have a new house and we're clearing off some brush down there. Actually, the threshes are clearing off brush and, and it's kind of a mixture where our land kind of goes together there. And they were burning the brush piles. And it's amazing, you see all the brush piles, you see it all burn up and all be gone. And this whole imagery goes up clearly. And I can still see these round circles where the burn piles are. That's what vineyards look like. They would have these round circles, these burn piles, where they would burn the, the branches that they would cut off. And so they're probably seeing these burn piles as the Lord is teaching this. And they're seeing the fruit that's bearing really good with all the grapes on it while the Lord is teaching this. And so the Lord is, is making this very clear to them. Some actually believe that there could have actually been some of these burn piles still smoldering at the end of the day because they wouldn't always go out uh, immediately. But either way, they see the imagery, they know the imagery, and it's very clear to them. And he says in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, this is a great promise. What a great promise here in God's word. Quite the promise when it comes uh, to, to trusting in the Lord and God's promises to us, but it comes with a stipulation. And notice here the stipulation. That is, we have whatever we ask, but his words must first abide in us. It reminds me where the Lord said, you can have whatever you want if you pray in my name. And it doesn't mean at the end going, in Jesus' name. What it means is, in his character. His name was who he was. So if we're praying in the character of Jesus, something that Jesus would pray for, we know we have what we ask. Now he's saying the same thing about this. If my words abide in you, if you know my word, and, you're, and you ask something in accordance with my word, there's the key, God's going to do it. Because this is an amazing promise. Now, you might say, you know, well, what about those that I've prayed for in my family to come to the Lord? They haven't come to the Lord. Listen, God will not force any man or any woman to make a decision for him. He doesn't, he, love demands choice. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love isn't forceful. So God's not going to make anybody do anything. But if you pray for God to convict them, God will be faithful to go to their heart and convict them of their sin. And God will be faithful to draw them to himself, but then they have a choice to make once that conviction hits. And that's where the rub comes in for us. Sometimes I wish they didn't have a choice. <laughs> Make them be saved. You know, it's just you will be saved today. And that's it. Sorry, young man. And that's how it's going to be. Yeah, whatever. But it doesn't work that way because that's not love. Love demands choice and freedom. And so the Lord says here, but if you ask according to my words, it'll be done. Verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Remember fruit, more fruit, much fruit. This glorifies God. When you guys bear much fruit, he's glorified. So you will be my disciples. And true disciples will bear much fruit because they're staying connected to the vine. Staying abiding in the vine. That is connected in there. The question for us as we finish today is, are you abiding or staying connected to the vine? Are you connected to Jesus? Are you in the word? Are you in prayer? Are you, are you saying, Lord, flow through me? Well, maybe God has pruned something in your life and you're, you're too busy fussing at God. You know, God, how could you do that? You took that out of my life. You know, you can't, wait a minute. God doesn't do anything except for our good. He loves us, which means you're only going to grow more. God says, I want more of my life to flow through you. I want more of my life to go in you and you be a stronger branch. Trust me. Will you trust me? Okay, Lord, I'll trust you. If you get to that place, now you're going to bear fruit and more fruit and much fruit. And the question is, are you bearing fruit today? Are you staying connected to the vine? And, and are you letting God work in your life and, and even do the pruning that's necessary to be done? You know, as we finish today, here's what I want to pray. I want to pray that we would allow God to prune whatever needs to be pruned away. And if you've got something this morning where it needs to be cut away from your life and God's saying cut it out, let him cut it out. Let him do it for you. You're the one that has to follow through and take the action to do it. God will clip it. Sometimes God will clip things without, without even us asking. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's the most shocking and the most surprising. But God is faithful to do it. Don't fight him. When it happens, say, Lord, I don't understand this, but here's what I do understand. You're opening up a better pathway for more of your life, your source of life to flow through me in this branch so that I might produce more fruit. And guys, who doesn't want to produce more fruit for the Lord? And when we produce more fruit, what happens? You glorify the Father. I want to pray and ask for God to help us to allow him to prune our lives, allow him to let his source flow through us, allow us to grow that we bear more fruit and much fruit that we might bring glory to the Father because that's his desire. And I know for every believer in here, that's your desire as well. 
Let's pray and ask him to do it. Let's pray. Father, I do pray this morning, God, that you would make us those that produce much fruit. God, there are some in this room today that are producing fruit. I praise you for that. There's some others in this room that are producing more fruit, and I praise you even more for that. God, there are some in this room today that are producing much fruit, and I give you extra glory for that, and you're getting extra glory for that. But God, our desire is, and my prayer is that all of us would want to bear much fruit, not just fruit, but much fruit. And the way, Lord, we do that is to stay connected to the vine. And also, Lord, to allow you to prune things out of our life that need to be taken away. And right now, God, I know that you're convicting some of us in this room of things that need to be pruned things that need to be clipped, things that need to be done away with, low-hanging branches that are doing nothing but keeping us dirty and diseased and sucking away the life flow of you that can make the upper branches thrive and produce more fruit. So Lord, I pray today that you would just put your finger on all those places in our lives, all of us. And Lord, we give you permission to trim them away, to prune them off, and to remove them. Our desire is to produce fruit that brings you glory. And I pray we would not be satisfied with the fruit that we're producing, but we would seek to produce more. Maybe even laying down some freedoms to do it. Father, you know what's going on in every heart. Work by the power of your spirit. Thank you that you are the gardener, that you're the vine dresser, and that we don't have to do this. All we have to do is ask you to do it and then yield to you, and you will do the work. So God, do the work in us. We ask you would do it. We yield ourselves to you. And God, we pray that you would bring much fruit and much glory to your name through our lives. God, let the word that was spoken today, let the seeds that were planted today produce much fruit for your glory. Because that is why we exist, to bring glory to you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Produce fruit for the Lord. Let him work and enjoy him. He's faithful and he's good.